We have some great stories lined up for you. We're going to do a preview of the local elections there next Thursday. We've already got some idea of what Labour are sort of using as their strategy. It's to be really right wing. And we've got some attack ads they've put out against the Lib Dems. You can see what you think about those. And we've got the latest howler from Nadine Dorries. Always a joy um, to show you those, even if it is a little bit depressing because she's actually in charge of quite a lot of serious policy issues in this country right now. I'm joined as ever on a Friday evening by Aaron Bastani. How are you doing, Aaron? Very good, Michael. Delighted to be joining you this evening. Delighted to have you with me. Now, if it looks like I'm using my arms a bit weird today, it's because I've, I've had an accident today. All I can say is don't try and catch a staffy when they're running at full speed. So I've got some defrosting peas on the table, but I'm, I'm hoping that's not going to affect um, the, the quality of the programming. I'm sure it won't. The local elections are less than a week away. There'll be an important temperature check for both Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer. And Labour should be well-placed to make gains. The government are overseeing a cost-of-living crisis of historic proportions, and Boris Johnson's lockdown rule-breaking is never far from the headlines. But apparently, you should vote Labour because the Lib Dems want to legalise drugs and get rid of nukes. Now, I'm sure there are some people in the electorate that these stances will appeal to, but the problem for Labour is that there's also a lot of people who ads like this will turn off. According to a YouGov poll conducted in January, 67% of Labour voters would like to see soft drugs like cannabis either decriminalised or legalised. That's even more than Lib Dem voters, among whom 64% support some form of decriminalisation. And Labour's stance is also at odds with the general public at large. 55% of all voters support decriminalising soft drugs like cannabis. Of course, for any of you now considering voting Liberal, we should note that they don't actually have a policy of legalising drugs, however um, appropriate we might think it would be for them to put forward that. Rather, they propose taking a medical rather than a criminal approach to drug use and addiction. It's far short of full decriminalisation. But it turns out that even that is too much for Labour. In this ad from the Labour Party, they aren't attacking the Lib Dems for being soft on drug dealers or county lines gangs. Rather, they think the Lib Dems are too soft on the victims of the drug trade, which is people addicted to drugs. Yes, Keir Starmer's Labour appears to be gagging to send drug users to jail. Another bizarre aspect of Labour's campaign is that they've decided to invite over senior figures in the Israeli Labour Party to campaign for them. They'll be door knocking in Barnet, which has a large Jewish population. And it seems a pretty crass attempt to show that Starmer wants to get past Labour's anti-Semitism row by showing how committed to Israel he is. Obviously, they're hoping these targeted ads going around this particular constituency with members of the Israeli Labour Party, this won't affect their vote share there, because I assume they think that they're advertising, they're, they're advertising these Facebook ads to people who really want to see drug users locked up. But the problem for the Labour Party is that the rest of us can see all of this because they get shared on Facebook. And I imagine that advert saying, it is the Lib Dems who want to be soft on drug users. I would have thought that's going to lose them more votes than it's going to gain. Aaron, I want your take on this. The issues we've just mentioned there, I don't think they probably will be the key ones when it comes to determining the outcome of, of next Thursday's elections. But they do seem to be showing the true colours of Keir Starmer and what his project means, don't you think? That's entirely right. So uh, I think <clears throat> it might look a bit strange that Labour are talking about rather esoteric national issues uh, when we're looking at local elections. I mean, people watching this live, watching this later, listening to it as a podcast, probably got some literature through their letterbox from the Labour Party in the last <clears throat> couple of weeks. And it has inevitably uh, referred to national issues. For me, I put it straight in the bin because I'm getting letters in regards to local elections and councillors talking about the cost of living crisis. So last year, it was the NHS. These, these people have absolutely no competence or power or influence over these outcomes. Waste of paper, waste of my time and waste of time for people delivering them. What this tells us, along with the attack ads and the Lib Dems over cannabis of all things, is that the priority for Keir Starmer is what they perceive as the rehabilitation of Labour ahead of the 2024 general election. The main thing for Starmer and the people around him in the May local elections is not Labour winning councils, 
It's not Labour winning the largest number of councillors. It is about a staging post towards that end goal, which is forming a government at the next general election. Now, it's explicable. I think that's quite a short-term, myopic view of politics, because ultimately, councillors and councils really matter. They have huge amounts of power. And fundamentally, you're, you're misinforming the public about what local elections actually are for, and what the competences of local elections are about. You know, we're, we're seeing a Labour Party now, which has gone from community organising to almost exacerbating, playing on and worsening political literacy. Local elections have nothing to do with drug decriminalization or nuclear weapons. Um, very strange, but for me it was very interesting in so much as Keir Starmer, so loved by the blue tick libs, so loved by them, which I've never really understood if I'm quite frank, he is attacking the Liberal Democrats, and of course they're obsessed with the Progressive Alliance, on an issue which most of them agree with the majority views in the Labour Party that should be decriminalized um, in, a, in a bid to undermine them. And I think, look, it's just one more instance for me anywhere where I think, my God, blue tick libs, are you, are you going to get what the Labour right is about? It's not about collaboration. It's not about social liberalism. It's not about expanding the, 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 the individual's liberty. It's about authoritarianism and smashing alternatives, even when they're more progressive. I agree with most of that. I'd push back about one minor thing, though. So I think you said there that the cost of living crisis, that's sort of like an inappropriate focus for these local elections. Now, from my perspective, I would say that, one, Labour should you know, be talking about that essentially 90% of the time, whatever election we're in, because that is the big issue that they have to politicise. It. it is what people really care about. They should be talking about it. Also, I do think that local councils can have an effect on the cost of living crisis. So if you think, you know, some of the biggest... Um, you know, outgoings for, for families is housing. If you've got a local council that's willing to to try and borrow money to build extra council housing, then that is going to, you know, lower people's cost of living. You've also got issues such as council tax or what's quite significant, actually council tax rebates, council tax benefits for people who are on low incomes. That's in the, the power of a council. So I agree with you on nukes and drugs. This is a stupid thing for the Labour Party to be talking about at this election, just because it will lose them as many votes as it will gain them. But on the cost of living, I I, I think I... I differ with you there. Michael, yeah, let me come back to you. First of all, Labour hasn't been focusing on the cost of living crisis. It started talking about it in the last week, right? So they were talking about Partygate until this time last week. Uh, secondly, I agree, it's a really important issue and Labour should absolutely be talking about it in local elections. But I mean, I don't think that councils and councillors really can do very much about cost of living with the exception of reducing council tax. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't quite buy that, Michael. Strategically, in the long term, yeah, of course they can. Uh, but if you look at, for instance, the Hackney Labour Party, who've had a really ambitious, bold um, plan, which they outlined ahead of elections next week with regards to a Green New Deal, a local Green New Deal for the borough, uh, that's really exciting. And that's the stuff that councils can change. They can't really do much on the, on the cost of living. They, they, they can, look, they can collaborate with trade unions. Labour councils can support striking workers. They can insource things. They can pay a living wage. But they, 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 they're not going to be able to change the levers in terms of the cost of living. No, I don't. And again, look, it's important to talk about it. I think people, when they're canvassing on the doorstep, obviously should be talking about it. I think it should be on their literature. But I, I think it's worrying when you're deceiving the electorate. Look, when it comes to local elections in this country, the electorate is already underinformed. You have highly literate people politically. They can have degrees in politics, and they don't really know the competences which fall to councillors and and local councils. They don't know what a ward is. They don't know the very structure of local democracy and the people that make decisions on their behalf. You know, and that's not attacking anybody. That's just a fact. We're not really taught these things when we when we obviously should be. So I partly agree with you. It should obviously be part of Labour's rhetoric, Michael, although I don't think it has been. But in terms of what councillors are saying they can do, I don't think it's true or fair. They can do very much on the cost of living. No. Well, can, oh, I suppose. Well, we'll park it. I mean, I, I think they can in some areas council tax in terms of t council tax benefits, people on low incomes, but then also um, especially in council housing. But let's move on from policy. And because aside from policy, there are other problems on the horizon for Labour before next week's vote. Liam Byrne MP, who just last year was Labour's candidate for Birmingham mayor, has been suspended from Parliament for two days 
Kind of funny punishment there. That was after a bullying complaint was upheld against him. The BBC reports the ex-cabinet minister and MP for Birmingham, Hodge Hill, ostracised a former assistant after a minor office dispute, an investigation found. Parliamentary Standards Commissioner Catherine Stone said his behaviour was a, quote, significant misuse of power. Mr Byrne said he had apologised and was, quote, profoundly sorry. A number of other allegations relating to unreasonable behaviour by Mr Byrne and pressure to work excessive hours were not upheld, the report found. The investigation into Byrne began nearly two years ago when his former assistant David Barker lodged a complaint with Parliament's independent complaints and grievance scheme. Um, of that, the BBC writes, um, Mr Barker said Mr Byrne had begun excluding him following a minor disagreement about being able to continue food bank collections in the days leading up to the first COVID lockdown in March 2020. Mr Barker was sent home and then ignored by Mr Byrne in WhatsApp communications within the team during lockdown and when he contracted COVID-19, he said. He was subsequently signed off work with stress on the 4th of June and Mr Barker said Mr Byrne had made no efforts to contact him before a colleague informed him a month later his contract would not be renewed. Um, it all sounds rather odd and fairly unpleasant. But a bigger problem, a bigger headache for Keir Starmer might be what was on the front page of the Daily Mail this morning. They ran with Labour's lockdown lies and hypocrisy, and they revealed that Angela Rayner was present at the so-called Beergate event on the 30th of April 2021. Now, of that, you've probably seen this video. In it, someone creeps up to a window and films Starmer through the glass. He's drinking a beer. There's another beer on the windowsill, but no one seems to have a drink. And one of the men in the background is eating something with a fork from a plate. A woman, Labour MP Mary Foy, is speaking. There are at most five people in view. Now, it is true that indoor gatherings of people from different households were not allowed at the time this video was taken, and so it seems rules likely were broken. But it's not really on a par with the multiple parties in Downing Street at the height of the first lockdown, some of which had up to 100 invitees. However, this story does raise one problem for Labour, because according to the Mail, the Daily Mail first asked Labour on January 14th whether Mrs Rayner had been present at the notorious Durham Drinks event. A senior Labour official replied, quote, Goodness me, with all that's going on, it's an old story. Angela wasn't there. It was Mary Foy's office, unquote. But rumours about Mrs Rayner's presence at the meeting persisted. She was pictured in Durham at an election event with Sir Keir early the following morning. And then Labour last night admitted it had lied about an event at which Sir Keir Starmer is alleged to have broken lockdown rules. In a sensational U-turn, they say, Labour acknowledged that Angela Rayner was also at the event on April 30th last year at which Sir Keir was filmed enjoying a beer with officials at a time when indoor socialising was banned. A Labour spokesperson said last night, quote, Angela was present. A party source claimed the previous denials had been an honest mistake. The Daily Mail obviously made a big deal of this on their front page. Is it a big deal? There's two separate points to make here. So is what happened with Labour from what we've seen, and by the way, this is what was recorded, right? It's not like if this hadn't been recorded that Keir Starmer and Labour would have volunteered the information. This is what, this is what we've found out, right? And it's fair to say you've got far more people recording the goings on at 10 Downing Street than anywhere else. So this is what we know. Is what we know in any way comparable to what we know at 10 Downing Street and what the Tories were doing? Absolutely not. Does it seem that Keir Starmer broke the rules? I think he I think I think he did. I know the police are not processing this, they're not taking it any further. As far as I can see, I don't see what he's done right that Rishi Sunak did wrong. I mean, maybe you can correct me on this, Michael. I, I, I don't quite understand how he's not broken the rules. That said, I think that's more of an indictment on the rules and potentially a, a little bit of a lack of flexibility. But again, you could say the same, I suppose, for some of the number 10. Um, events. That's certainly what the, the government's been saying. I would dispute that. I would disagree with it. I think they're such egregious, outlandish breaches of the rules that I think, you know, you, you can't allow for elasticity. I think probably in the case of Keir Starmer, maybe you could. But it, it does seem to me like a breach of the rules. Angela Rayner not being there and now them saying that she was five days before local elections after rejecting her being present there outright for months on end. Come on, pull the other one. Uh, we weren't born yesterday. Um, again, is that in any way comparable to what the Tories have done? No, not really. Uh, but I think the fact that the fact that Keir Starmer, I think, did break the rules uh, is, is clearly going to be a way for the right-wing press to neutralise that line of attack from the Labour Party. I mean, that for me is the most important 
point that can be uh, that can be concluded from this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think on this, the most legitimate argument I've seen from sort of Tory outriders is sort of Tom Harwood saying, look, this is kind of exactly the same as what Rishi Sunak did. And it's a bit gaslighty for the press to suggest otherwise. And I think strictly that kind of is true because the only fine that has so far been given out at Downing Street was for one of the events that was, or the only time that Boris Johnson has been fined so far, sorry, mm -hmm. is for one of the events that was the least offensive, really, mm -hmm. having the birthday cake out at, you know, it did seem like a workplace environment. Obviously, it was against the rules, but it was similarly a breach of the rules in the same way that Keir Starmer there seemed to be breaking the rules. It didn't seem that egregious. It is those other events you know, where you had 100 people invited, which presumably Boris Johnson knew about. It was it was those events which we haven't yet seen the full facts about, which I think show the clear water between what Boris Johnson has done and what Keir Starmer has done. So I think the right-wing Tory outriders, by focusing purely on which fines have been given out, which is for the, it seems to me, the least offensive events, and uh, that seems to be what's misleading about that particular argument. Um, let's go on to our final sort of segment on the local elections, because last year, the most exciting um, thing about the set of local elections was what happened immediately afterwards. Back then, poor results for Labour and a failed attempt to demote Angela Rayner looked briefly like they could topple Keir Starmer. This time, though, any fireworks would most likely come from the Tory side, because they're the ones who are expected to do relatively poorly. But we perhaps shouldn't get our hopes up too high. This is from James Forsyth in The Times. As you know, Rishi Sunak's best friend. Um, he writes, one senior backbencher who has called for Johnson to quit says, quote, there's no groundswell to move and expects that should a confidence vote be called, Johnson would win it. If he did, under Tory rules, he'd be safe for another 12 months. So if the rebels moved now and lost, their hands would be tied regardless of what the Grey report reveals. The consensus in Tory circles is that Johnson will make it to the Queen's speech next month. One well-connected minister tells me a poor local election result is so baked in that, quote, you would have to have a very bad set of results to change things. Aaron, from a drama perspective, could next week's elections be a bit of a damp squib? I mean, this looks like extraordinary expectations management from the Conservatives, doesn't it? They could lose sort of five, six hundred councillors and they could say this is a terrible night for Labour, which, by the way, the media will go with. And people watching this, no, I'm no fan of Labour or Keir Starmer. But if they win, if you win five or six hundred councillors, it, it, it's a good night's work. But I can almost already see Emily Maitlis saying, well, at this point in the electoral cycle, forget that crap. Look at the 2017 local elections and then what happens in a general election not long after. The, the, you know, po politics isn't two plus two equals four. It's about sentiment and things change very quickly. My God, as we know in 2019, look at the European election results, look at the local election results that may, and then look at what happens in the general election in December the same year. So I... I, I I would push back against any inferences that anybody wants to make with regards to general election results from local election results. I think that's a fool's errand. I think you can make certain conclusions about a particular seat, right? So if Labour wins Worthing Council, and by the way, until the last five years, Labour never had any councillors on Worthing Council, they could be about to win Worthing Council. If from that you say, well, I think Tim Lawson is going to lose that seat to Labour at the next election, or you want to make a broader point about you know, problems for the blue wall as, as London Labour voters move out and they move to other parts of the southeast. Yeah, those are reasonable inferences. Uh, but when you see people say, well, on this swing and this turn, a load of crap, it's a bunch of people trying to fill up air. So I think it is interesting. I mean, the only, the only way these results really matter, there's two, there's two outcomes here where the results are bad is where Labour win fewer than several hundred seats, right? Because obviously the, the Tories have been doing terribly with national polling. Obviously, Boris Johnson is really disliked. Boris Johnson's personal approval ratings have been basically where Corbyn's at their worst were. I mean, it's really important to underline this. So if in that context, Labour only get a couple of hundred extra councillors, I think there are problems for them. Um, I, think, I think there's major problems for them. Equally, if the if the Tories lose more than eight hundred, I think Boris Johnson is toast, but not immediately. That's the important point. And I think the lesson again that we have to sort of draw on here is after two thousand eighteen, the Labour Party was winning parliamentary vote after parliamentary vote. Corbyn's personal approval ratings were good for him. They were leading in national polls, 
Um, and of course, you had a great set of local election results in 2018, which the entirety of the media tried to downplay. But even then, I feel like the Tories were very smart and they showed how they are the party of the establishment through not losing their call. Hold on, uh, take your time, don't make any rash decisions. We can, we can undermine and discredit these people bit by bit. We've got 18 months to do that. That's how they thought about Corbyn in 2018 and they were right. And I, I feel like they would do the same even if Johnson lost catastrophically next Thursday, which I, I don't think the Tories will. I think they have a very bad night. I don't think it'll be historic. The local election results in May 2019 were historic. Uh, so it's interesting. I think it's baked in and I think they've got the political wisdom and street smarts to, to not rush to any decisions. Will he be there at the beginning of next year? I think he would. If I had to put money on it, we said this, what, fortnight ago, Michael, I think, or, or maybe a week ago. Um, if I had to put money on it, Boris Johnson would be the Tory leader at the next general election. Uh, but it's, that's far less likely than it seemed a year ago. And will he do as well as we thought? I mean, almost certainly not. Earlier this week, two female Tory MPs claimed that they had both witnessed a senior Tory MP watching porn on his phone, once in the Commons chamber and once in a committee. Well, now that MP has been named, he is Neil Parrish, who has been the MP for Tiverton and Honiton since 2010. Parrish is currently chair of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee. He's now been suspended from the party. It probably goes without saying, this man is not a giant of the Tory party. I'd never heard of him before today. But it does turn out one of the issues he has spoken publicly about is the issue of the, as then unidentified, porn watching MP. With the knowledge you have now, watch this excruciating clip of Parrish on GB News this Wednesday. Whoever it is, I mean, surely they would have to have the whip removed, wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, I think the whips office will do a thorough investigation and we will wait and see that result. And I think, you know, from that, then the decision will have to be made what action to be taken. Is there a problem with cu the culture in, in Parliament, do you reckon? I mean, it's not just Conservative MPs, we should say, you know, this is a, a cross-party issue. But there is a sense, I think, for people outside looking in, uh, that there are just a whole range of stories, even this year, involving uh, different MPs, that, that, that gives a sense that there's a cultural problem inside Parliament. I think if you've got sort of 650 members of parliament in what is, you know, a very sort of um, very intense area, I mean, you are going to get people that step over the line. I mean, is it, you know, I don't think there's necessarily a, a huge culture here, but I think it does have to be dealt with and dealt with seriously. And I think, you know, that's what um, the whips will do um, in our whips office. Aaron, that was quite difficult to watch, wasn't it? How is this guy a parliamentarian, Michael? You've got somebody just so casually barefaced lying. I don't understand what his reasoning was. Does he think, oh, if I go and talk about it on the television, then nobody will think it's me? I mean, did he not think this would come back and make him look a bit strange? We are dealing well, with I mean, some really extraordinarily weird people in British politics, aren't we? I mean, my hypothesis on that one is probably he was invited to talk about the evening news anyway. Like he, he wasn't invited to talk specifically about that story. And then he sort of guessed he might get asked about it at the end. And if he'd pulled out, because obviously on Wednesday, everyone was like, well, who is the MP? And all the journalists were trying to work out who the MP is. They knew it was a backbench Tory man. Now, if you're a backbench Tory man and you suspiciously pull out of a media appearance on that day, then maybe he thinks that could have helped identify him. So he just had to go on and just sort of like... Yeah, but just pretend, he's been identified. Pretend nothing he's been is identified happening. And now he looks, he's been identified and now he looks ridiculous. I mean, now he just looks deeply un... Why would anybody trust anything he says? How, how, how well, would I mean, any account that he gives now of what's happened have any credibility? This isn't necessarily a man who, you know, benefits from having brilliant judgment, Aaron. So that, that might be what we're That's witnessing true. here. I mean, it, it wasn't like he wasn't going to get caught. You've got two different female colleagues from his own party seeing him do this themselves. Like the idea that he was gonna, I find it very surreal, Michael. I mean, the judgment of these people, my God. You really could, look, we say this so many times on the, on, the, on, on the show, you could get 650 people just from the local whatever, down the beach in Bournemouth on a nice summer's day, or you go to London Fields, any, anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. You could get 650 people better at running the country than this lot. I mean, 
really extraordinarily weird, strange people. Let's go to a further update, um, because Parrish has released a statement on his website. Following recent allegations regarding an MP's use of their mobile phone in Parliament, I have referred myself to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards in the House of Commons. I will be cooperating fully with any investigation, and whilst it is ongoing, I will continue to perform my duties as MP for Tiverton and Honiton. I will not be making further comments at this stage. Now, it might be the case that his understanding of performing his duties is what got him into trouble in the first place. Nadine Doris has once again taken to the airwaves to bolster her case for privatising Channel 4. And speaking to Ian Dale on LBC, she used the example of Channel 5 to make her case. Now, say who's done that really well since they were privatised and a small number of years ago, I think it was three years ago, five years ago maybe, is Channel 5. If you look at the amount of investment Channel 5 puts into the regions and how well Channel 5 has done since it's been privatised, I think that's a model that I call Channel 5 the levelling up broadcaster. That is a model for, for how broadcasting but you, but, but can work. Just- now, we, we could debate whether or not Dorries is right that Channel 5 really is the levelling up broadcaster, but there's a more glaring problem with what she said in that clip. That's because, contrary to a claim she repeated twice, Channel 5 was never privatised. And that's for the simple reason that it was never publicly owned. Channel 5 was launched in 1997 as a private company, and it's been a private company ever since. Unfortunately, Ian Dale didn't pick Dorries up on the mistake. Otherwise, we would perhaps have been able to enjoy another moment like this. I would argue that to say that just because Channel 4 has been established as a public service broadcaster and just because it's in receipt of public money, we should never kind of audit the future of Channel 4 and we should never evaluate how Channel 4 looks in the future and whether or not it's a sustainable and viable model. It's quite right that the government should do that. But, but, but Channel 4 is not like the BBC. Uh, it, it, it's not in receipt of licence fee money. It, no. it, it makes its money from commercial operations. And... So, although it's, yeah, and that, I mean, there are a range of views. Obviously, Channel 4 has taken a particular position uh, on the future. Um, there's so can I just say that the discussions about the, what we do with Channel 4 and how we evaluate Channel 4 also happened before I arrived yeah. in my post. That was from a select committee meeting last November. Aaron, have you ever in your life seen a front bench politician who openly knows less about their brief than Nadine Dorries? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of bad actually, Michael, now, because I see terrible stories about her and I see people sharing clips on Twitter of her saying something utterly ludicrous. And I just think, why bother? You know, this is like, this is like mocking a, a child. And I know that sounds really mean, but honestly, it's like, oh, Nadine Dorries, it's something absolutely moronic and nonsensical. But, Okay, well, what day of the week is it, and it does it end in a Y? But you know what, Michael? People, people need to know that we have really incompetent politicians. They need to know that. And I think Nadine Doris, she's just so brazen about it. She's just even there, like you know, the the other the, the lady alongside her was that a civil servant or a political advisor? I think usually in those select committee meetings, who you have is the minister in charge, and then you have the civil servant in charge of the department. Yeah. So the civil servant answers the technical question. But whether or not Channel Four gets public money shouldn't really be considered a technical question because that's sort no, of my, the basics of what you should know if you're going to privatise Channel 4. Yeah, my point is the wonk, whether or not it was, because sometimes obviously policy advisors can be civil servants for certain roles, but the, the wonk, the civil servant was, was trying to bail her out. Even then she's like, no, let me make a, a fool of myself for 20 seconds longer. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, it's, it's like we have one every week. Maybe we need a new podcast just about Nadine Doris saying stupid shit. Yeah. I mean, I do agree. With, obviously, if this was just an ordinary member of the public, then the fact that they don't have much knowledge about how the media works or whether or not you say tennis courts or tennis pitches, you know, these things wouldn't matter. We wouldn't want to be mocking someone for sort of lapses of, of knowledge, you know, of, of that sort. But this is the person who was literally in charge of culture, media and sport in this country. And also isn't just sort of playing a caretaker role. She's trying to revolutionize the media in this country, selling off Channel 4, very, very significant policy move. And she hasn't bothered to learn the bare minimum about any of it. And I, I feel like if you were going to try and shake things up, lots of people's jobs on the line here. You know, it's a very, very significant decision to make. The, the bare minimum you can do, even as a matter of courtesy, is 
learn how the goddamn organization works before you tear it to shreds. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, creative, the, the creative industries in this country are worth hundreds of billions of pounds. These are huge industries, which she's, she's kind of, she's interfering in. I mean, I, sp I suppose the best analog would be, imagine if you had a, a Labour government, a left-wing Labour government, and they said, we're going to reform the city of London. We're going to um, make the Bank of England subject to government oversight. It's going to lose its, its nominal independence. It's not independent, really, but it's nominal independence. Uh, we're going to have interest rates set by the chance of the Exchequer. We're, we're going to do really, really big things in terms of reforming economic policy. And then they said, um, and somebody said, well, what are interest rates right now? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe what, 20, 30 percent? Okay, okay, you don't know what interest rates are. Okay, what, what's inflation measure? Uh, inflation, um, don't know, sorry. That's basically <laughs> Nadine Dorries, but it's been transposed to, like you say, culture, media, sport. The, the Tories don't care about these things anyway. They, they never have done, right? This has always been... This has always been the most sort of Mickey Mouse department under the Conservatives because they love law and order, they love finance, because none of them in DCMS can go on to get nice cushy lobbying jobs afterwards. They don't have like, you know, the 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 grace and favor homes that you get with being foreign secretary, home secretary, defense secretary, you get to hang out with the military. You know, those are the jobs they love. Or if you're really politically ambitious, you know, um, you might have a junior role like um, the Veterans Affairs. You could make a bit, of, a bit of a name for yourself. No, DCMS, culture, the arts, these are all lefties anyway. We can't please them. You know, they always want more. Uh, I find it very strange, however, that it's Nadine Doris, who is the kind of the revolutionary uh, that they've placed in that department. Before you had uh, John Whittingdale, you know, who, who was a, a core, hardcore Thatcherite and was who's seen as, again, you know, he, he was an ideologue, but he thought about how you can apply market systems to the BBC, etc. Uh, and actually, in the end, of the, when they renewed the BBC Charter a few years ago when, when he was there, it wasn't as bad as people feared. And then he's gi he's given way, and I don't like him. I don't agree with his politics, but he, he's not he's not a complete um, he's not a complete fool. He, he's then given way to Nadine Dorries. I you need to explain this to me, Michael. What's her function? Is it to make Boris Johnson look smart? That's the only that's the only thing I can kind of make out of this. Is okay. Let's have this kind of bullshy, um, obstreperous, confrontational person talking complete nonsense. Uh, and and if we have them there, they'll make enough stories and kick up enough of a stink that we can do some more stuff on the side and you know the, the the media won't really talk about it what's your thought i mean i think that i think you've probably hit the nail on the head there and, and that's what's going on because you, what do you do to make yourself look less of an idiot you put someone who's willing because it's not just that she kind of is an idiot when it comes to answering questions about media culture and sport she's she's really really willing to go out there you know she's a real fighter she's a trooper for boris johnson when he's done completely ridiculous things you know when he sort of talked about Keir Starmer in, in, in Parliament and Jimmy Savile, it was Nadine Dorries who was willing to go on Channel 4 News and just keep mm. repeat, repeating, the Prime Minister wouldn't lie. The Prime Minister wouldn't lie. The Prime Minister wouldn't lie. And that is a great person to have in your team because they're willing to absorb all of that flack. And also it's kind of helpful if the person who's willing to absorb that flack is in charge of a sort of function which people don't really consider when they're making their vote. Obviously, you don't want your Chancellor to look like a complete idiot because people might then not vote for your party. You also probably don't want your defence secretary to look like a complete idiot if what you're trying to s say is, you know, we're, we're strong on national security. But if the person who you go out whose, you know, function is to look like an idiot is in charge of sport and culture, I mean, no one thinks that you know, sport's going to disappear all of a sudden, right? So I, I think they think it's a low stakes department and, and, and you're right, she can, she can take that flack. Um, let's get onto the more substantial issue of, of policy and the potential prospects for a privatised Channel 4. You might remember when Nadine Doris first announced the plan, she cited this as her key motivation. She says, I have come to the conclusion that government ownership is holding Channel 4 back from competing against streaming giants like Netflix and Amazon. Now, of course, this was always a silly idea. There is no way Channel 4 can compete with the budgets of Netflix and Amazon. You can see here the total annual spend on content from Netflix, Amazon, the BBC and Channel 4. So Netflix in 2021 spent £13.5 billion on content. Amazon Prime, £10.3 billion. BBC Television, now we're in 2020, £1.4 billion was their average, sorry, their annual spend. And Channel 4 spent £522 million pounds. So 
Netflix is spending 26 times as much as Channel 4, and Nadine Doris thinks they can compete. You know, they can charge $8.99 just as Netflix charges $8.99, even though 26 times the amount of money is, is spent on Netflix content. It's not particularly plausible. It's also worth noting that unlike Channel 4, Amazon Prime's video service doesn't even need to break even. They're playing to different rules. Amazon Prime Video is a loss leader to drive people to purchase other goods from Amazon. Channel 4 couldn't do that, privatized or not. Netflix, for its part, does make a profit. That was $1.6 billion in the first three months of this year. But even Netflix, which is the big giant, the big incumbent, their business model is under threat. In the first quarter of this year, and for the first time ever, Netflix lost subscribers. And that has caused its share price to fall by 49% in the past month, by half. You can see the big drop here happened on the 20th of April after Netflix announced that fall in subscribers. So obviously, this is a business model where you need constant growth. The moment you can't demonstrate constant growth, everything collapses like a house of cards. Aaron, do you think the Tories genuinely believe that a privatised Channel 4 can compete with Netflix? And, I mean, if, if they did, should it, should it want to? Is this a competition Channel 4 should be entering into in the first place? Mm. I mean, it's funny. Come on. Also, when I look at Netflix, they're spending $13.5 billion on content creation. How many Ted Bundy series can that create, right? Or how, how, how many weird true crime dramas? The $13.5 billion, Michael. I mean, that's... That's a, that's a big old budget just for inventing Anna and the Ozarks. And uh, there's not that much good TV. I'm kind of with Elon Musk on Netflix. I'm not a fan. Um, I, don't like, I don't dislike it for the same reasons he does, though. Uh, I just don't think it's very good. Like you say, by comparison, Apple, um, uh, Channel 4 have a, a budget of half a billion. Apple, I just said them, about six and a half billion. So that wasn't included in that image there. All of these organizations have huge, huge budgets. And Amazon, so far this year, have lost 200,000 subscribers in the UK. I believe streamers, streaming platform more broadly, streaming platforms more broadly, sorry, uh, have lost 1.5 million uh, in 2022. Now, that's partly explicable because, of course, people are going out more. So previously, they may have had three or four streaming subscriptions. Now they just have one or two. They don't have the literal time to watch all that content. Uh, but it's also partly because it's a saturated market. And this is a, a very common phenomenon in, 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 in capitalist markets. You have a profitable industry, you have investment flood into it, and then you have market saturation. And at a certain point, you have such market saturation that a number of the um, firms involved in that particular market are no longer profitable, they collapse. So a good analog here is, for instance, coffee shops. It became very clear at the beginning of the 2000s that high street coffee chains were very profitable. You see Costas and Starbucks and Capineros and Pretz um, offer, offer coffee and sandwiches on pretty much every high street in the UK. You know, London Bridge, you've got like four pret a mangers on one street. Uh, and that's a saturated mar uh, market. What happens, of course, is your margins get lower, you have high competition, and a few of those, those companies then go out of business or they have to shrink. I think inevitably what we'll see with streaming is the exact same thing. So in 2022, globally, globally, the figures you just showed are for 2021, globally, the expectation is that $100 billion will go on content creation for the big streaming platforms. So Apple TV, Disney, Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime, $100 billion. So that seems to me like the recipe, uh, the perfect set of circumstances for a saturated market. Why on earth would you take the BBC and Channel 4, which have existed and worked very well and acted in the public interest for decades, in the case of the BBC, far longer, but iPlayer has been out an outstanding product for decades. Why on earth would you look at that scenario where realistically a few of those platforms aren't, aren't going to survive the next five to 10 years by virtue of what we're seeing? Why would you look at that and say, you know what, I want a piece of that. I want a piece of that. How about we get iPlayer or Channel 4 to collapse in the next five, 10 years too? That's a great idea. Uh, by the way, the proposal right now, I should be clear, is just for Channel 4, but the Tories have said the same thing um, about the BBC previously. So it's, it's a disaster in the making. At the same time, I should be clear, Michael, people have talked about Channel 4 and its historic role in British filmmaking and how it was making such original avant-garde programming in the 80s and the 90s. True. But it's stuff now. Let's be honest. Channel 4 stuff now is crap. 
It's often been bigoted. It's been racist, lowest common denominator, cheap to make, stacked high, crud, which in no way resembles, you know, uh, public service broadcast. So I'm not one of these people who's going to defend Channel 4 and, and pretend it's something which it's not, because it isn't. I don't think it in any way resembles the organization we saw 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but also, you're almost guaranteeing its, its collapse by saying it should take on the likes of Netflix and Apple TV, because like you say, these are huge companies. Apple and Amazon are, are, are trillion dollar businesses. You know, I don't know what their market capitalization is right now, but they've been trillion dollar businesses. Uh, there's not many of those. Tesla as well is a trillion dollar business. I think Facebook's a half a trillion dollar business. But the idea that Channel 4, rinky dink Channel 4, can compete against a trillion dollar business, which like you say, can lose money year after year after year after year to sink its competitors, which is why, by the way, I think Amazon and Apple will, will win this with a saturated market. And, and they'll be happy to lose money for five, 10 years if it sinks Netflix. I think Netflix is a, a problem in that respect. Uh, in any case, that's Clash of the Titans. And then you've got Channel 4. I mean, come on, do me a favor. And, and, and Britain is, a, is, a, is a, an important um, uh, sort of content creator of English-speaking cultural products in, globally. We obviously punch above our weight, as people love to say. And so I think you know, this, should be, this should be a perfect moment looking at those platforms to say, Look, Channel 4, BBC should be able to do something really distinctive in the public interest. We've got all these series on Netflix, which only, only ever go to two series because it's optimized for eyeballs rather than actually a, a narrative story which makes sense. Let's be unique and offer, offer products which actually uh, appeal to people and, uh, and resonate with them as programming for a long time. Opportunity missed. Um, we've got one more story to get through, so I'm going to ask you to be super quick, but I'm just curious, Aaron, why doesn't um, Elon Musk like Netflix? What's the, what was that about? He, he, I think he, he referred to Netflix as having the woke brain virus. There was a very revealing exchange on Question Time this week. The topic was the Tory plan to ship asylum seekers to Rwanda if they arrive via irregular routes, and an audience member pointed out how that policy demonstrates a double standard. The politicians who don't promote safe routes, safe and legal routes, they, they come illegally because you've blocked all the legal routes. If you want to stop that and you want to send people to Rwanda coming across from Calais, so you are proposing that um, all immigrants from Ukraine should also be going there as well, should be processed there as well, because surely people who flee Ukraine are passing through safe countries. So. Let's, let's send them to uh, Rwanda as well. Now, that was a really interesting challenge. If the reason we should have no sympathy for people crossing the channel is that they've arrived via a safe country, so in that case, France, why are we so accepting of Ukrainians who have come almost universally via a safe neighbouring country, such as Poland or Moldova? Well, this is how Telegraph columnist Camilla Tomini responded. Well, most of them are ending up on na in neighbouring countries. You yeah, know, Poland's safe, taking... So millions. they shouldn't be able but, to uh, but apply of, here. But that, that's, that's an interesting distinction because much has been made. Well, why are we being so generous to the Ukrainians now and not as generous to a different group They're of people? They're passing through a safe but, country. Yeah, but, We're not but, being but, generous to the Ukrainians. That's part of the problem. Okay, okay. But, no, but of course, of course, whenever you're processing people coming into this country, you're going to have to have a list of priorities. And what's You're going to have to be why well. Exactly. That's the whole point. That's why, why it's the so, other people that's why it's so important to categorize people. But what are you going to do right now, as Mariupol is being, um, you know, bombarded with Russian missiles? Are you going to say to a mother and her child that she can't come because somebody else who might be already She's waiting in a, a hotel safe country, in Chris. safety in the UK takes more precedence? That was Camilla Tomini arguing that the bombing of Mariupol should mean we treat Ukrainians differently from those from other war zones. And on one level, she is right. What's happening in Mariupol is a human catastrophe. As you can see from this drone footage, the city has been almost completely demolished by Russian bombardment. What were once apartment blocks, hospitals and offices are now burned out shells. It is, of course, almost impossible to know how many people have died there. Is it still under Russian control? But the city was home to 430,000 people. But while the bombing of Mariupol is horrific, it's not unique. 
This is Damascus, Syria in 2019. Again, you can see an entire city devastated, this time by Assad's attacks. The UN estimate that at least 350,000 Syrians were killed over the course of that war. 13.5 million people were displaced, with 6.8 million of those living as refugees around the world. Finally, this is drone footage of Mosul, Iraq in 2017. It shows the state of the city after a US bombing campaign to drive out ISIS. In that year, the city had a population of 1.5 million people, and it's estimated at least a million people have been killed and 9.2 million displaced since the start of the Iraq war. All this is to say that while the suffering of the Ukrainian refugees is severe, incredibly severe, it is not on any objective level different from that of people from other war zones to whom we have been less than welcoming. And it was noticeable that it was the only person of colour on the panel who wasn't taking Tomini's arguments at face value. Let's look at some more of that exchange. You'll see here Tory Employment Minister Mims Davis um, gets involved partway through this clip. So they well, shouldn't be allowed but, to come here unless they go to Rwanda. But it's a different scheme. I mean, MIMS is b b more in tune with this, but it's a different specific scheme. Why? That's why the government it's introduced the family why? scheme. No, but that's why the government introduced the, the family scheme, because it was saying to Ukrainians, if you have somebody in Britain that you want to but link I, up with, I would we will like have an X okay. amount of... I get what, what you're Sorry, trying to say. I, there's like a double, to, I get the point. You're trying to say like there's to a double standard people, here. Yeah, I would like to take people in from Afghanistan, which you abandoned. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. But you're not offering that to Afghani people or Syrian people. You're well, yeah, offering it to... OK, let's let, Mims, right, Camilla, let's let Mims answer that. So we are helping people from Afghanistan to resettle. No. Um, well, we are, because I'm doing it. I'm on committees I and working friends. with job centres and processing and helping people start that new life. And there's more people coming that we need to plan for as well. And of course, we want people to come and settle and have that new life and that new experience. But we also need to have homes for them. We need to have jobs for them. But what about the point that's being made about the double standard? What about the point about the double standard, which I think is the point you're making? There isn't a double standard. Making. It's uh, schemes that work. And of course, we've got now a global immigration policy where we can uh, get skills from all around the globe and welcome people. We've obviously got the new trade deals and interventions with uh, people around the globe because not only people in the EU have skills and abilities and want yeah, to come a, here. That, okay, that, so, I think that's a different thing. But, but, but it's important. We've had 185,000 people come here since 2015 who've been settled and supported in uh, the Hong Kong situation where we've needed and wanted to bring them here and give them that sanctuary. That doesn't change. Okay. What we're trying to do is Right. break the model of people smuggling and okay. I think letting You've people made that die point. in Thank the you. channel is unacceptable You've made that point, Mims. many of the points tonight. That was very confusing. There were loads of different arguments were mixed up with each other. Some of them were completely irrelevant. Points-based systems and trade deals have nothing to do with refugees. But on the question of asylum, Mims Davis said, we can't let in more Afghans because we need to have homes for them. Well, there are two responses to that. First, we've already found a temporary solution to this with Ukrainian refugees. Members of the public have been invited to host refugees and 100,000 people have come forward. Why not expand that to other groups? The longer term answer, of course, to the question of housing is if there is a housing shortage, it's only because no government has built council homes for the last 40 years. So terrible, terrible excuses there from that Tory politician. And Davis also claimed UK asylum policy contains no double standards. But then to make that point, she cites a group of people who've got special treatment, people from Hong Kong. Now, again, I'm not saying, just like with Ukrainians, we, we should not be against welcoming people from Hong Kong. People from Ukraine, people from Hong Kong, is absolutely right they should be welcomed to this country. But so should other people. And it's hardly an answer to anyone who thinks we don't treat people from the Middle East or Africa in a manner that's fair to say, oh, look, but we treat the people from Hong Kong well. Now, let's look at one last response from the Question Time audience member. Can I say something about my personal experience? And that's, I tried to help a friend who's got four girls in, uh, in Afghanistan and they're, they're suffering under Taliban. I offered, I'm happy to offer them home and pay for them. But you don't allow that policy. So you have that policy for certain countries, certain nationalities, certain races. 
I am happy to accommodate, but you don't offer that route. You don't offer that safe route. I was told that if they get out, if they were smuggled out of Afghanistan and they get themselves to India, they're not allowed to come to UK where they have family members. I'm not their family members. They have family members. But they were, I was told by the Home Office that they can't because India is a safe country. So they have to stay there. Why Ukrainians can't stay in the safe countries as well and not be allowed here? I just want to know the double standard. Okay. I think we've got the answer we're going to get uh, from the government here. We hear your point. I'm going to move on and take another question. Aaron, what did you make of that exchange? And I mean, that incredibly powerful intervention, I think, from that member of the audience. I don't know what there is to say, Michael. I mean, we know there's a double standard on on immigration policy that has been a long time for a long time but equally we haven't had the ukrainians you know come here yet in the in the same numbers that they've gone to say poland and while i am sympathetic to the argument that ukrainian refugees are being treated differently to non-europeans afghans or iraqis who by the way i think britain has a special obligation to because we have participated in displacing them um, Syrians, although that responsibility less so, because we didn't literally catalyze massive decade-long conflicts in uh, a decade-long conflict in Syria. We did that in Iraq and Afghanistan. While I'm sympathetic to that, the truth is that I also suspect, in the long term, Britain won't pull its weight with Ukraine either. Um, so it's an interesting one. Equally, equally with Hong Kong, you know, if, if tomorrow two million Cantonese wanted to come to England. Um, I, I don't think the Tories would be able to stomach it. And I think I think big parts of their voting base would get very, very angry because their USP, their USP, Michael, since 2010, the one reason why people vote for them more than any other party, yes, of course, rising house prices, dislike for labor, they want lower taxes. But if you were looking for a big reason, it's, it's immigration. So yes, there's a contradiction there. Yes, there's um, there's a double standard. But I think actually when push comes to shove, with regards to refugees from anywhere, Britain won't pull its weight relative to other countries in Europe. We'll have to see. I mean, I'm sure relative to other countries in Europe, we won't. I think it's, just, it's, it's almost sort of the discursive double standard as well as the one in terms of practical policy that I think so many people find so offensive. And as I say, you know, it, it was very notable that it was the person of colour on the panel who was like, you know, there's something going on here, Camilla, that you're not talking about, right? And, and I feel like it's in the, in the coverage of the Ukraine crisis. And as we always say, we should be incredibly welcoming to Ukrainian refugees. They are fighting a just war. But when you see sort of, you know, the Times talking about how to make a Molotov cocktail if you're Ukrainian, you compare that to how, you know, we talk about the Palestinians. It, it shows how different people are valued different amounts. And that's not to say we should value the Ukrainians less. It's to say we should value the Palestinians, the Afghans, the Iraqis and the Syrians more. We've always known this, but this just sort of demonstrates how this is not because there is this sort of ideological objection to people resisting occupation with violence. It's because, you know, people didn't care about the Iraqis, they don't care about the Palestinians, and they don't care about the Syrians, even if their their cities are getting bombed just as badly as, as Ukrainian cities right now. Yeah, for me, the real the real outrage here is comparing Yemen to Ukraine. So in Yemen, if you hear, you know, the Houthi rebels are fighting against forces which are basically propped up now by the Saudis, you don't hear Houthis without hearing Iran-backed Houthi rebels. These are people who are taking on one of the best equipped air forces in the world using British and American technology. There is no conversation in Britain right now about whether or not we should be helping Yemenis come to Britain as one of our chief allies in West Asia and the Middle East bomb them back to the Stone Age. So for me, that is the real, the real double standard because it's happening right now. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, there were a million cases of cholera recorded in Yemen because basically the Saudis had destroyed clean drinking water infrastructure in that country. That is being done with our blessing, uh, let alone even trying to mitigate it or deal with the, the displacement of people. So for me, that is the real double standard. Yemen and Ukraine. It's partly racial, but it's also partly to do with Brit Britain's uh, defense and security, quote unquote, interests abroad. Exactly. And I mean, that's where the Hong Kong example is so telling because, you know, as I say, we should be welcoming people from Hong Kong. But one of the reasons why the government is so keen to is because they can pose, just like they can with Russia, uh, a geostrategic enemy as, as the bad guy. 
Aaron, great point finishing us off there. Thank you for joining me this evening. We will be back on Monday at 7 p.m. Hopefully my finger will still be moving. Um, So have a great weekend. Have a great bank holiday Monday. Good night. 